Okay, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. Our story this evening is about a legendary and iconic plane, the Spitfire Fighter. On April 14, 2012, the Telegraph published an article announcing the discovery of 20 Mark 14 Spitfires buried in their original transport cases uh, in Burma, or now Myanmar, at the end of World War II. According to the article, a British farmer named David Cundall, which is the reason that we're all here this evening, had located the planes after a 15-year search. The story fired my imagination. World War II aircraft, lost in the jungles of Southeast Asia, preserved in their original transport crates. It sounded incredible. If the planes were indeed there, then their heritage value to the British would be incalculable. As Sebastian Cox, who's the head of the Air Historical Society uh, at the RAF, would tell me in October of this past year, if these Spitfires are found, it will be the single biggest find in World War II artifacts in our history. So I decided to pursue the story. Wargaming is a global video game developer and publisher. We make games about uh, the tanks and planes and ships of World War II. Now, uh, it may strike some of you as odd that a video game company would sponsor an archaeological dig in Southeast Asia. It is not the normal thing. But the wargaming team believes in the value of preserving history. After all, we make historically informed video games. History is part of the DNA of our company. It's part of who we are. Our team includes historians, history enthusiasts, armchair generals, grognards, military veterans, and even a couple of uh, tank commanders. Okay. And over the past year and a half, uh, since our, our company has gained some prominence, we've reached out to museums and historical groups around the world to forge partnerships and fund exhibitions. We want to make sure that the vehicles of World War II and the stories of those who operate them uh, are preserved for future generations. So let me show you a couple of the collaborations we've done. Uh, firstly, we've worked with the USS Iowa, which is a 1942 battleship. Uh, it's 887 feet long, weighs 45,000 tons, and is simply an amazing engineering uh, marvel. It is a national treasure. This thing had been rusting at mooring for many years until the Pacific Battleship Center, which is a nonprofit group, got behind it to see if we could preserve this ship. And uh, we've helped out by working to create a digital theater experience on the ship, which recreates the Battle of uh, Okinawa in 1945. Uh, so we have a, a new uh, CG trailer that plays in the um, uh, deck two of the ship. Okay, A uh, little closer to the UK, uh, we work with the Bovington Tank Museum, where you can see we've uh, built the Wargaming Education Center. Uh, Let's see. Uh, we also are one of the principal sponsors, uh, three years running, for Tank Fest, which, if you've never been, is quite a lot of fun. They bring out many of the World War II tanks, rev them up, and drive them around the sort of tank park there. Uh, so we made a donation to the museum to transform an unused room into a contemporary state-of-the-art classroom with a modern AV system, about 20 computers, and seating for about 60 students. And the Tank Museum's education service provides an important and proactive link with schools and teachers around the UK. And very close to home, here at the Royal Air Force Museum, uh, both at Cosford and here at Hendon, uh, we've been involved in the Dornier 17 project. So those of you who uh, watched the news last week saw that at Tuesday afternoon, uh, London time, uh, the team at the Royal Air Force Museum, as well as SeaTac and other entities, successfully recovered a Dornier 17 bomber, the only known surviving copy of one, uh, from the bottom uh, of the English Channel off the coast at Goodwin Sands. Uh, the plane was then put on a barge uh, by the Atlas lifting device here, and it was just transported um, to uh, the Cosford Conservation Center and is now, we're happy to report, uh, safely ensconced in the hydration tunnels where it's being sprayed with various chemicals to stabilize it and prevent all the sea salts uh, interacting with the oxygen in the atmosphere and dissolving the plane. Uh, over the next two years, uh, conservation work will stabilize the aircraft, 
They'll prepare it for an exhibition uh, here at Hendon to mark the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Britain. And Wargaming is delighted to be sponsors of this effort. Okay, so let me tell you about how our company got involved in the Burma Spitfire project. In April 2002, Prime Minister David Cameron met with the Myanmar president, Thane Sein, uh, to discuss lifting sanctions. But one of the other topics they talked about was the repatriation uh, and restoration of 20 crated Spitfires, which were reportedly left at Mingladon Air Airfield at the end of World War II. Okay. So this article appeared in The Telegraph, uh, I think on April 14th, and it says the Prime Minister secured a historic deal that will see the fighter aircraft dug up and shipped back to the UK almost 67 years after they were hidden more than 40 feet below the ground. This story was then uh, picked up and amplified with another Telegraph article that ran a story about David Kundal, the aviation enthusiast who claimed uh, to have found the uh, Spitfires at the airport. Very quickly, this went viral and global. So the Time uh, Magazine news thread picked up on it. It was aired on Fox News across the United States. And then uh, from there, it was on BBC World News and Time and Business Insider and many uh, independent dailies. Uh, the press would simply crescendo over the next year. Um, after October, there were dozens more articles and then literally hundreds by the time we get to January. Okay. So, um, I was in the United States when all this was uh, beginning to percolate through the press, and it struck me as just a fascinating story. So, I googled David Kundal and at the end of April, uh, managed to connect with him and offered to fly him out to San Francisco to our North American headquarters to talk with our team about his discovery. So on May 15th, um, he came to our studios and presented his evidence, and this included geophysical reports and photographs and other documentation. Given the statements by the Prime Minister, as well as news reports in the BBC, we decided that this story was worth investigating. So we decided to fund an expedition to go and look at the site. And if planes were found, then we would, be, uh, we would engage the right experts to recover them and perform the work to the highest professional and ethical standards. Two weeks later, uh, after meeting David, uh, we're in Myanmar. That was as fast as we could get visas. Um, and we were racing the imminent arrival of the monsoon rains, which would make it utterly impossible to do anything until around November. Uh, but we soon discovered that securing the contract to excavate the planes would be a lot more challenging than we had initially expected. There we go. Uh, Myanmar is an absolutely beautiful country, and I feel very privileged to have had the opportunity to visit uh, at this historic time in the country's history. Uh, the Burmese I found to be deeply spiritual people, and I found the whole experience profoundly moving. Um, one of the groups that we worked with was called Shui Tong Por. They are a Burmese company headed by Tutu Za, uh, who's a mid-30s businessman, um, and they played a key role in helping us navigate the various ministries to secure the contract. Uh, and it turned out that actually there were quite a number of rivals. They had all read the newspaper reports and pretty much every treasure hunter on the planet decided that this looked like a fun place to go. Uh, so we soon found that there were two rival British teams that had put in applications through the British Embassy to the Ministry of Planning. Uh, there was also an Israeli group and reportedly there are groups from Singapore, Japan and India. Right, uh, so we had to secure some allies. Uh, the Myanmar government had asked us for a letter of support from the UK government. They asked uh, for uh, David Cameron to write a letter, but uh, we reached out to the British Embassy and their uh, Second Secretary Fergus Eckersley and Deputy Ambassador Andrew Hine very graciously provided us with the letter uh, of support which we were able to take to the various ministries in the government on Her Majesty's service. Uh, we did a lot of driving last summer, uh, so June and July and into August and beyond. 
if you want to do anything in Myanmar, you have to go uh, to Naypyidaw, uh, which is the new capital towards the center of the country. And reaching it is a bit of an ordeal. It's about a 230-mile drive there and back. Uh, we did this trip more times than I care to imagine. It would be like driving across the continental United States there and back, uh, I think is about how much driving we did. And along the way, we had many, many meetings with various ministers, deputy ministers, government officials, civil aviation authorities, and whatnot. We had to produce uh, uh, excavation plans, safety plans, and all kind of uh, paperwork to make sure that everything was done uh, up to uh, highest standards. Okay, and moving on. Uh, we succeeded. So on October 16, 2012, Shui Tongpur, along with David Kundal, finally secured the contract allowing us uh, permission to excavate at the Mingladon site. The signing ceremony took place in the capital, and the deputy ambassador, Andrew Hine, um, would speak very warmly uh, about the project as a joint heritage project to bring people together. And this sentiment was echoed by one of the Myanmar officials who also spoke at this event. Again, the uh, news media uh, turned out in force, and this story quickly circled the globe. Now, uh, from June to September of last year, my main focus and our focus as a group was simply to secure the contract in the face of determined rivals. So during that time, though, we began to find some discrepancies in the story of the Burma Spitfires. We thus decided to assemble an expert team of archaeologists to undertake an independent desktop study of all of the documentary sor sources. So now I'll hand it over to Andy Brockman, uh, who is with us on the expedition, to explain what it is that we found. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to uh, echo uh, Tracy's uh, welcome to Hendon here tonight. Uh, thank you for turning out to listen to us. Um, that's me. And that's my first real um, contact with the Burma Spitfires project. Um, in fact, I, I need to step back slightly from that. Um, just before that article was published in May last year, I was phoned up by my colleague Rod Scott, who's on the front row and you're going to be hearing from shortly, um, on his way home, in, and he was stuck in traffic on his way home from Bristol, and was wanting to discuss the... Um, the potential of this particular article that had just been published in the Daily Telegraph. Um, the reason for that is that those of us who work in the archaeology of modern conflict, and that's what I do that's primarily, that's what Rod does, and my colleague Martin Brown, who you'll be hearing from later too, um, we are very familiar with stories of iconic objects, not necessarily Spitfires, but other iconic objects like Harley Davidson's, Willis Jeeps, other types of aircraft like the P-51 Mustang, Lancasters and so on, which are alleged to be buried in, uh, at the end of runways or down mine shafts or otherwise um, disposed of uh, in secret um, at the end of World War II. Um, having had a long and uh, very enjoyable discussion with Rod about the potential of this, I actually got to thinking about it in actually slightly more detail and I wrote um, this article for uh, an online uh, blog, Heritage Daily, and um, in it, um, I took a, sl as you can tell perhaps from the title, a slightly tongue-in-cheek look at the story. Um, but I also said that actually for us, uh, for, for archaeologists, um, in a rapidly developing um, discipline, which is the archaeology of aviation in particular, uh, as a, uh, as a sub-branch of what we do, um, this was quite an important story because whatever was at the bottom of it, um, it uh, I suggested that we needed archaeologists involved because... Digging a hole and finding an object at the bottom of it is digging a hole and finding an object at the bottom of it. Digging in a hole archaeologically, recording it archaeologically, observing it archaeologically, tells you how that object came to be there, why that object's there, and all sorts of other interesting things as well, about, perhaps about the other objects that the JCB has cut through while you're going. Anyway, um, as a result of that article, um, a few weeks later, I was contacted by uh, Anna, uh, Anna Bowers there from our, um, our media partner, Room 6 Oak Productions in New York, who've been making a documentary about this uh, particular project on behalf of um, Wargaming. And this, the contact came as a result of extensive conversations within Wargaming and within Room 608 between Tracy and um, our, uh, our director, Mark Minucci there. And the upshot of this was, after a lot of telephone conversations and Skype conversations and meetings when they came to London to do filming, um, 
you, um, I was asked to undertake uh, basically an independent assessment of the historical dossier that, uh, that, that, that they'd been given when they took the project on. And uh, there you see uh, the, our first um, meeting in, in, in my, uh, what I laughably call my office, um, where we're looking at some of the, uh, and discussing some of the data that was available. Um, the first thing I was asked to look at in detail was this photograph. Um, this had been published in the Daily Telegraph, and it's subsequently been published in lots of other newspapers, and it's been billed as Spitfires being prepared for burial in Burma. Um, if you Google Spitfires being prepared for burial in Burma, you get this picture and you don't get any others. Um, that's because uh, until this picture surfaced, there were no pictures of Spitfires being prepared for burial in Burma. Um, we don't know the origin of this picture. However, oops, sorry. Um, when we looked at it in, in, in detail, we actually managed to pull a serial number off that box there. And it appears that, not conclusively, but it's highly likely that that is an aircraft that was manufactured in Britain and then sent to the Mediterranean, and is either an aircraft that ended up being written off in a crash in what was then Palestine, or ending up in Russia as part of the Lend-Lease to Russia. Um, it's certainly not a Spitfire in Burma. Now, that immediately suggested that perhaps the rest of the evidence ought to be looked at in more detail as well. Now, because it was a, a it, as, as Tracy's explained, it was a global project, it was a, a project that was gaining traction in the media um, and, a, and a lot of profile, we decided that we'd adopt a, a kind of um, a, a public persona, and that was really the crime police procedure, or a CSI Yangon, if you like. Um, and the first thing we set about doing uh, was objectively understanding uh, our, our scene of crime, if you like. And so... Um, that's the beginning of a long period, uh, particularly working in the National Archive at Kew, pulling out um, files such as this. So this is a, um, an RAF um, from the Three Photo Reconnaissance Unit um, in 1942. That's a photograph of Mingladon Airfield, what's now Yangon International, um, about four or five months after the Japanese had invaded Burma and taken over the, uh, uh, the, the airfield. And you can see we've got a set of runways across there and then a, a runway at the base there, turning areas, um, you can see various structures and remember this road here coming sweeping round off to the north there, north at the top of the frame, that's the old prone road, the old prone number one road, that's an important part of our story, please remember that particular location. The area we're going to be particularly concentrating on is this area round about here. Um, the next thing we do is start to play around with overlays so that we can compare the contemporary landscape with the historical landscape that we've just seen. There we've just seen 1942. Here we're seeing 19, early 1945 overlaid on top of a contemporary Google Earth image. And you can see running through there is the new single runway of Yangon International. There's the Prome Road coming round and it stops. And in fact, the, the modern road runs around the end of the airport, and in, we particularly identified three areas. Area A over here, which was um, in, the, in, the, in the legend of Mingladon, it, su it suggested that aircraft may have been buried in that area. Area D up here is a known engineering and dispersal area for the, um, during the RAF and Japanese periods. Um, area C, um, again, we know there were structures both in the RAF period and in the Japanese period. And finally, um, Area B is another area that was indicated by um, a, a apparent witness statements as to being the location of the burial of aircraft. Um, and in 2004, geophysics work was done there, which suggested there were metallic anomalies in that particular area. Um, here is another piece of uh, infrastructure. Um, I'm showing you this picture, which was, the again, the modern Yangon main runway overlaid on a different set of airport infrastructure. This is the 1945 rebuild by the RAF. We've got the main runway there, and then the taxiway around the side of it, the no on the north side of that main runway. I'm showing you that to give you the impression that we're starting to build up layers in the landscape. Just to, by looking at the photographs and maps and plans and so on that goes with this information, we've got 
a lot of things going on in a relatively small area of landscape, and we're trying to understand those, because if we are going to take this forward to field work, then we need to know what those things are and where they are, because they're likely to turn up in some form or other in the archaeological record. But stepping back from it and looking at the historical data, um, taking the police procedural model again, the, to bury Spitfires or anything else uh, uh, substantial at Yangon, the Royal Air Force required an opportunity, a motive, and the means to do it. The opportunity certainly existed. The British uh, moved back into Rangoon, uh, occupied Rangoon in early May 1945, and the, um, in fact, the first um, Allied personnel into Rangoon was a mosquito uh, crew that landed at Mingladon, um, which had been deserted by the Japanese. Uh, from that moment on, it was, a, it was an RAF airfield again, and it was, remained an RAF airfield through until the end of British colonial rule in Burma in, in early 1947. So the opportunity was certainly there. The motive is a different matter. That's the motive. Um, we looked at cabinet papers, secret reports to the cabinet on the security situation in Burma because it was suggested there was a connection with um, separatist movements and so on, such as with the Karen. Um, we looked at command files uh, from uh, uh, the Southeast Asia Command, Mountbatten Park, um, and right down to the individual unit operational record books. Um, in all that material, there is no evidence of a motive of any kind which would lead the RAF to decide to bury Spitfires or any other aircraft. Um, there's not even any evidence that that action was contemplated or, or discussed, let alone undertaken by anybody in Southeast Asia Command. As to the means, um, again, going back to basics, and archaeologists tend to we do this, we, 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 I guess we're sceptical by nature. We, we want to prove things. We're like journalists. We want to prove things from multiple sources. Um, and we also want to define problems. And the problem if you're trying to bury airplanes on a place like Mingladon, just in terms of sheer infrastructure, um, taking a sort of average crate of rough, uh, you know, a hypothetical crate of 40 foot by 10 foot by 5 foot, which is approximately the kind of size we're talking about, um, gives you a nice round figure of 2,000 cubic feet. Um, to bury, say, 16 aircraft, which is half the number that was the favourite number, which was 36, um, that's 32,000 cubic feet or, you know, 10,666 cubic yards of material to remove, and then you've got to put it somewhere while you're burying your things, and then you've got to put it back and if you put it back on top, you're going to have a great big mound if you bury the thing flush. Um, or if you don't bury the thing flush, um, you've still got settling issues and you've got to tamp it down. And it, it, it's something that would leave a big mark in the landscape um, if you think about major excavations. Um, the other thing is that commercial excavation is based on a productivity with a modern 360-degree tracked excavator of around... 50 cubic yards of material per hour per machine. Obviously, these are, these are broad figures. These are crude figures because of different soil types and so on, but give you a rough idea. So to dig a hole of that size, you're talking about 213 hours of continuous work for a modern machine. Could they do it? Um, we, I talked about operation record books. Um, the, this is for, from uh, 132 Repair and Salvage Unit, which was operating out of Mingledon at this period. And the, the crucial line is here. This unit is expected to meet all the crane commitments to both Mingledon and Zayaquen, which was the sister airstrip to Mingledon at Yangon, um, with one serviceable base city vehicle, one Coles crane, and one Holmes wrecker is available for strip clearance. That's principal engineering unit. They've got three vehicles to work across two airfields. Um, and in fact, the operational record books of that period are a story of shortages of everything from personnel, because there's a great churn of personnel because of people being repatriated um, at the end of the war, um, but also shortages of everything from uh, just the, the everyday um, necessities of life for the personnel that were living in, 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 in Rangoon at the time, to timber, local labour, heavy equipment, as you can see. Um, here's another example of the problems that the RF was facing. Um, this is the RF uh, Mingledon um, operation record book, uh, the, the, the actual command of the airfield, and it basically refers to the taxi tracks and elements of the runway uh, being continuously under repair. It, the infrastructure is in appalling condition. Um, 
it's in June 1946, so it's nearly a year after the, in fact, it is more than a year after the, um, the, the British have moved back into Rangoon, but they're still having huge problems making Mingled on a functional air airfield. And the key thing, Commandant Royal Engineers has been, uh, had always brought to the attention of him, uh, uh, of he and him and his staff. Uh, that's because the RAF did not have any of its specialised airfield engineers in theatre. Uh, they were reliant on the Army and the Indian Royal Engineers to supply their infrastructure needs for major construction. We also have these fantastic um, paintings uh, that are here in the archive at Hendon um, from uh, Thomas Barclay Hennell um, showing the kind of work that was undertaken at Mingledon in that um, summer of 1945 as they're extending the runway, uh, sorry, um, as they're extending the runway in this lower picture here and repairing the runways and taxiways. And as you can see, they've got bulldozers, but you can't dig a hole with a bulldozer, um, graders for leveling, and here, the principal uh, tool is the pick and shovel in the hands of a local labourer or a Japanese prisoner of war. Um, that's the workforce that was available to do that 216 hours of continuous work. So is there a contemporary evidence for what actually happened to surplus air aircraft at Mingledon? And there is. There's a lot of it. Um, starting at the very top of the chain of command was Sir Keith Park, um, who was the air, command South air commander in Southeast Asia at this period. Uh, and in his um, report, which he wrote, um, was published in the London Gazette in 1951, but he wrote it at the end of the war. Um, he said, during the months from May to August, just May to August, 1945, and he's talking about southern Burma here, uh, the repair and salvage units uh, returned to service 830 aircraft and dismantled a further 420, which had been written off. That's 420 aircraft and he specifically uses the word dismantled. Um, so there we've got the commander-in-chief saying what's going on. Um, at, at a more grassroots level, um, this is from Air Headquarters Burma in November 45, um, and the key passage is here um, at the bottom, where the command salvage officer has made arrangements to have the RAF station Mingledon cleared an accumulation of 100 aircraft um, of, various, uh, of, of various categories. Um, and here it says, the aircraft scrap, we can assume again, therefore, that they're being dismantled again, um, was put to good account. Local cottage industries are, being, are making cooking utensils and many other articles which were in short supply in Burma. This reminds you of something. There it is. Um, but in Burma in 1945, it's not the Spitfire appeal, and it's not swords into plowshares, it's warplanes into woks. In fact, it would have been impossible to bury created Spitfires at RAF Mingledon in the first place because no Spitfires were delivered to Mingledon and, and Rangoon um, between the fall of Rangoon in May 1945 and the end of British rule in January 1947. Any Spitfires that came to Rangoon, and there were many, were flown in and flown out again um, or taken out again on aircraft carriers. Um, we have got, however, uh, evidence of the problems that would have been faced by the, anybody trying to get anything into Rangoon Dock, certainly at the beginning of the period. That's what it looked like when the British moved in. Um, and it took them months to get anything like a functioning tran transport infrastructure working. We also know that when the RAF moved into the area with the occupation forces, they, the RAF logisticians, they bid for space for personnel, they bid for space for other forms of equipment, including vehicles, but they didn't bid for space for aircraft. Um, what we do have, though, is the very full records of number 41 embarkation unit. They were the RAF unit in Rangoon docks that was responsible for taking deliveries of RAF material. And their very full account uh, notes the only deliveries of aircraft of any, uh, at all in the period that we're looking at. And we've narrowed the period down where the, um, the legend says the aircraft were buried to a period between August 45 and April, beginning of May 46. Um, and if you look there, you'll see coming in from Calcutta, 19 oysters, a, a total cargo of 39 tonnes. There are other deliveries that run through until April. Um, it's also the case that we see most of those aircraft also leaving, and it's not clear whether any of them were even taken out of their transport crates. Some of them were, and there we've got a display 
a victory display in, 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 in Rangoon. We've got a Spitfire there, um, and we've got one of the Ulster Communications aircraft there. But that, uh, it, it may be that some of them were simply stockpiled as the war was coming to an end. What about the witnesses? And a lot has been said about, um, about witnesses in this particular story. Um, the witness material is extremely problematic. Um, we were given statements which were uncontextualized. Uh, there was evidence of leading questioning. There was um, some uh, statements that witnesses were believed simply because they said they were veterans from a, from the, uh, a, a particular um, a unit or whatever. The, the most famous case, the most high-profile case, is probably the instance of the American Seabees, the members of the American Construction Battalions, who were interviewed in Florida, um, who were allegedly involved in burying material at Mingledon. Um, and in fact, in all of the documentation, there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that uh, any significant numbers of American personnel, let alone Seabees with their equipment, were transiting through Rangoon at that time, as the legend alleges. Uh, and that material simply has to be discounted. Having said that, there was also um, some very good witness evidence. Uh, the Room 608 team and Wargaming um, were able to interview um, Group Captain Maurice Shaw, Short. Um, sadly, Group Captain Short died recently, but he was able to give a very full interview about his period as an aircraftsman on Mingledon, and then his subsequent transfer to Singapore. Um, and he recounted hearing rumours of odd things happening at Mingledon to aircraft in uh, af after December 1945. We also had the pleasure and privilege of interviewing another Burma veteran um, who's with us here tonight, Stanley Coombe. And um, when we were able to interview Stanley um, on several occasions, um, I think we were able to come to an understanding that Stanley has a very interesting testimony, a very important testimony, and an absolutely truthful and honest testimony once you uh, strip away things that other people have laid on top of it. And um, we'll be hearing more about that later on. Um, our conclusions, based on the comprehensive documentary study, the, the, the regressions, uh, the photographic regressions, the uh, other material that we were able to look at, um, by December, we were looking at moving towards a fieldwork project. It had stopped being a, um, a, a purely research-driven project uh, in, in the archive. The permissions were in place to, to dig. We were in a position to think about proving or not what was actually going on in the ground at, at Mingledon. So we started to put together an archaeological team to do that work, and we came up with various recommendations um, among which uh, were, based on the evidence, the expectation that there would be a great deal of surviving World War II conflict archaeology on the site, as those photographs I showed you indicated, that it was almost certainly going to be very close to the surface. Um, we also um, were expecting that there will be possibly um, elements of uh, dumping of, um, of rubbish, broken material, material that would have been destroyed before being buried, which was standard practice. It was common practice. It happens all over the world. Um, and people often go, you know, you, you could go out most weekends in this country and find people digging airfield dumps um, for, for the stuff that was dumped at the end of the war. So that we were fully expecting. Um, and um, we'd also identified things like the course of the Prune Road and so on as being a, a important locations to identify. And again, um, we'll come back to that later. Um, but if the... Um, the witness evidence and the documentary evidence didn't stack up. Why had the story gone global? Um, what if it really was a top secret operation that Mountbatten had, uh, had, had ordered uh, on his personal authority, which is one of the, um, one of the parts of the, uh, one of the versions of the legend? And um, the only way to be sure, really, in the end, that this was either a story that could be stood up or it was a legend, um, was to go to, uh, to Yangon and, 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 and undertake the process I'd asked to be undertaken in the, that original article, to use all the techniques that we've got as, as archaeologists to transfer the historical data into a study in the landscape, in that real live landscape out there on the ground, looking and trying to reconstruct it as it would have been seen in 1945, what evidence there is there to say what was there, 
Um, and to, uh, the, the term um, ground truthing is one that's very popular these days. It's one that we adopted, and that's what we uh, attempted to do. Um, Wargaming, again, I think to their absolute credit, um, backed us on this. They said they wanted a f uh, the, the best possible practice. They wanted something that was professional, ethical, uh, and produced good science, good data, and would be published, which is one of the reasons we're all standing here talking to you tonight. Um, so at that point, we took on board two other members of the archaeological team. Um, Martin Brown, uh, a very skilled and experienced field archaeologist um, with experience going back many, many years and particular uh, experience in the archaeology of conflict um, and including a period, uh, a 10-year period working for the Ministry of Defence archaeology team. Um, and also uh, another colleague, Rod Scott, who I'm about to introduce, um, who has a very particular skill set. Um, as well as being, a, again, another very experienced archaeologist um, with uh, experience on sites of all periods and uh, including a lot of work on the Western Front in France and Belgium, uh, his day job for the last 30 years has been um, as a, an ammunition technician with Her Majesty's Armed Forces. Um, and um, he has a particular also expertise in historic ammunition. The first thing that we always do is a desktop assessment. As Andy showed you earlier, there are various documents. He brought me in to double check all his research. We spent many a terrifyingly interesting hour in the National Archives, poring over various documents, one of which I went over was all the bomb damage estimates for Mingledon Airfield throughout the period of occupation. All the ones which we could get hold of, I went through. One of the things that became very apparent as you can see from this one, this is just a January 1945. We've got sticks of bombs coming in. These are quite large craters. I can't actually remember what was the aircraft were on this, but I would suggest they're something around the Liberator or possibly larger size. They look about 250 pound, maybe 500s. Um, everything was dropped on here. They go as small as 30 pound. They go as large as 1,000 pound. One of the things which have became very apparent on several of them, they said, we were also dropping one in 10 with delay fuses. The best way of stopping people using a runway or infrastructure is to drop bombs with delay fuses that are sitting there under the ground, not having functioned, and then at random times over the next 24, 36 hours, they explode, causing much more trouble consternation amongst the troops who might happen to be standing on top of them at the time um, and can in effect shut down the runways and the whole infrastructure of the site. The problem with those is they do actually have a bit of a habit of not functioning. They are particularly touchy. They are probably the worst that we can encounter within the occupation and the possibility of one in ten of them being there when they dropped thousands of bombs on the site is not really great news from an EOD perspective. The other thing is, although the site was not fought over by ground troops, particularly, it was defended. And if it was defended, the troops were there with weapons and ammunition. There is no guarantee on both occasions when it was handed over to the opposing side that they took that with them. In fact, I dare suggest that on both occasions when it was handed over to the other side, whatever was being used for defence was probably abandoned there. So there is a possibility that we may come across that as well. Having overlaid it with, as Andy showed you earlier, with the modern runway, we then start to get the targeting areas showing up as to what was dropped in what location. The interesting one here is the runway that's there. If you look at the 1940s, we have severe damage to the runways at that time. This is the modern runway, and this is the area that we're interested in. There's a prom road coming down here, and exactly the location where we want to dig, with all sorts of ordnance within the area. As Andy also said, one of the other 
hazards. It is not a hazard, but it is. It is human remains. It is not a hazard because we are very capable and very competent and able to deal with human remains. We will dig them forensically and we will give them the best possible chance for identification and recognition. However, everything grinds to a halt when you find one. You have to be very, very careful. It takes time and also as a very emotive subject and the fact that we're guests in this country, there's no guarantee what will happen to the dig should the locals suddenly say no well you have to stop now because human remains have been found and we're taking over so human remains are a hazard but they're not a hazard that's all i'm going to cover on that the the art of archaeology has many pitfalls and problems it has to be done right, but when it is done right, it will give you the ground truthing. And what I'll do is now hand over to Roger, who will come on and talk to you about the uh, geophysics side of the uh, actual field archaeology. Um, there's three of us in the geophysics team here. Um, uh, myself, Roger Clark from the University of Leeds. Um, I've been there actually somewhat over 30 years as well, and, and for at least half of that I've directed the MSc uh, program there in exploration geophysics um, and as well as teaching uh, a whole lot of other things. Um, and then Adam Booth, who you're going to hear from later, um, started at Leeds now at Imperial. Uh, and Andy Merritt, also um, not going to speak but is in the, in the front row with us, uh, is a student at Leeds currently. So um, actually I'm going to break the, the thread of the narrative a, a little bit actually and, and uh, step back in time um, to show you how the link um, between David Cundell uh, and this project, which that one, actually, actually came about. Um, the first contact we had at Leeds uh, from David was just a cold call. Uh, phone rang, this guy introduced himself. Um, I'm ringing you because I couldn't get hold of Stoke or something like that. Or, um, I gather you guys have geophysics equipment, but yeah, no surprise, we're a geophysics department. Uh, could I hire some? Uh, yes, why? Uh, and when he told me why, um, I was more than happy to say, uh, to say yes to that. Uh, really for, for a number of reasons. I mean, we're, we're certainly very, uh, very happy to do outreach projects. We, we, we work a lot with the local community in, in Leeds, as, um, in and around Leeds, as all universities should. We, we're part of that. Um, a slightly more personal uh, and selfish reason. I mean, they, it's great teaching uh, examples. We can get data sets that aren't out of textbooks or not perfect data sets we've made up ourselves. Uh, it means you can set really nasty exam questions with them because it's real data which never actually does what you want it to. Um, but it certainly matched uh, a personal interest in, in old aircraft. I, I grew up uh, in sight of RAF Biggin Hill, obviously a very iconic airfield uh, in World War II history. Uh, both my parents served right through the war, my mum in the RAF. Um, and, and it's a very easy topic to generate enthusiasm uh, and support for in among a university instead of the usual oil exploration or mineral exploration or earthquakes or volcanoes, all everyday stuff. Um, something a bit different like this was, is very easy to, uh, to get support and help from, from colleagues and students. Um, and that's actually how Adam Booth started off uh, joining in with the project um, some years ago and indeed how Andy Merritt has, has now. So we helped David with um, a number of projects uh, in the UK and, and overseas. Um, I was saying to colleagues earlier, the, the success rate in the oil exploration world is about one well in six is a, is a success. And, and I'm sure archaeology, <laughs> archaeology projects of, of that sort uh, are no really uh, better statistically. Some were successful. Um, and indeed, the doorstop in my study is a piece of a Merlin engine, which was... Uh, um, found with a mixture of David's background uh, researches and our geophysics. Um, some of them rather less successful, at least one place that I think David was hoping we'd find some um, scrap at an airfield waste dump actually turned out to be a broken sewer pipe. Uh, it was rather less pleasant to dig up. Um, but as, as those various projects developed, um, the Burma Spitfires story um, started to em emerge among the various enthusiasms uh, and passions that David had. Oops. 
Um, so um, David started out um, certainly narrating the story to, to us um, and using his own funding um, and with guidance from us about how to operate some equipment, how to design some surveys, did, did a number of reconnaissance geophysical surveys uh, out, out in Yangon, uh, either himself or, as you see there, a, a number of small commercial contractors um, and did, did, did work with him. Um, obviously, back at that stage, we're talking about around the, around the millennium, give or take, um, Burma was a, a delicate place to be involved with. Um, one thought a little bit hard about, about associating even yourself with it and certainly one's own institution, University of Leeds. Um, but the way in which David was doing that work was something we felt very comfortable with. It was... It wasn't really just parachuting in, in big teams, brushing everybody else aside and, and, and getting in there and doing the stuff. It was involved uh, a very great deal with, with, with locals. Um, for example, there was a, a, a local geophysical, uh, I guess we'd say consultancy, a, a university spin-out company um, who David involved as well. And, and it was a pleasure to, to be involved in kind of directing them from a distance. Um, and offering um, a bit of feedback and even mm, entirely accidentally leaving a few textbooks out there for them uh, that they couldn't have got any other way. And, and that style of work was something that we felt we could go along with um, as well as, of course, the, the huge uh, excitement of, of this iconic legend of, of Spitfires being out there. Um, that, that developed, um, as I say, in 2004. Uh, we actually went out and did some field work. Um, and what was, what was the remit of that? So how, how does geophysics fit into this? We're, we're not going to um, send you to sleep with a desperately technical lecture on geophysics, but it's, it's worth being aware of what it can and what it can't do in the context of this, uh, this survey. So, so David's project, as, as you see summarised at the top here, really developed to the point where um, it, the, there was another opportunity to go out to do some more field work and, and the opportunity and the time and the money actually for us to get directly involved in it. And so the question is, um, or from David's point of view, uh, are there Spitfire aircraft buried at the site? So what, what's the remit of that for, for, for geophysics? Well, as I'll, as I'll expand on in a moment, we're, we're not Spitfire detectors. Uh, we're geophysicists. And, and our job, our skill set, is, is to make maps of, of various properties that we measure at the Earth's surface and try from that to, to, to predict, to divine, some would say, what the subsurface is like in terms of its physical properties, things like density and sound wave speed, uh, and in this particular case, electrical conductivity is what we're going to get onto. So if you're looking for a Spitfire, um, are there areas of, of this um, former RAF air, airfield that have got unusual subsurface physical properties, something that stands out as different from natural geology? Uh, are they at the kind of depth that matches the, the, the stories that you, you've heard narrated already? Um, and are, the, are their characteristics, their shape and, and so on, consistent with what you'd expect from um, a buried Spitfire? So, uh, a buried Spitfire as a geophysical target. It, it's not the kind of uh, field practical you get to do very often at a university, is go out and take a Spitfire and bury it and do a survey over it and see what you... <laughs> see what you find, um, but that's the case with a lot of the things we look for and we're reasonably skilled at saying, okay, here are the materials it's made of, compare that to natural geology, what contrasts are we going to see, what kind of methods should we go out and, and survey with. So um, a Spitfire is, is really, in, in our terms, just a lump of metal, uh, the old bit of plastic and perspex as well, I'm sure, but principally it's a lump of metal, um, but it is mostly aluminium. For, for weight saving. It's not steel, uh, it's not particularly magnetic, therefore, uh, but it is, in contrast to most natural rocks, uh, very, very electrically conductive. So that's the, a starting point, but then you think, okay, it's going to be in a crate, although, as you've seen from Andy, not terribly convincing there would have been crates there, but if they were there, that crate would be full of air, water, uh, sludge, mud, well, maybe, but a metal is something that would still stand out rather uh, significantly. So the technique that um, we have focused most on uh, at the 2004 survey was a thing called the electromagnetic methods, EM surveys. Now, this is simply a, a grown-up industrial version of a metal detector. 
um, that you'll see amateur enthusiasts out using on fields and so on, hoping to find a, a medieval treasure trove, or um, successfully in some cases. Um, but it's, it's a rather bigger scale um, piece of equipment than that um, that we use. So here is such a, an EM34, as it's called. Um, these are a couple of students from Imperial College and Colorado School of Mines. Uh, not actually doing uh, a field survey, I would say, because that should be there on the ground if she was doing it properly. I suspect they're on the way to the cold beer tent uh, out on a, on a field trip in hot Colorado. Uh, but here, uh, here is uh, Adam Booth, uh, not on the way to the hot beer tent uh, at the Yangon site that we've surveyed. Um, how, how does this toy work? It, it summed up basically, um, these are basically two radios. Uh, one of the coils is transmitting a radio signal both sideways to be listened to by the other coil and down into the ground. And if there's anything conductive there, electrically conductive, that material acts as another radio aerial and retransmits the signal back up. So if there's something conductive there, this receiver coil here is two, two signals rather than one. Crudely put, that's about it. Um, the attraction of this big scale of um, equipment instead of the little thing on the end of a pole, um, it, is like, it is still very fast. You don't actually have to peg anything in the ground or whatever. It works about as fast as you can walk and log the numbers. Uh, but because it's fairly widely spaced like this with these big aerials, uh, it can see down to about 20 metres depth at, at most. The disadvantage of it, um, which is what makes it a reconnaissance technique, um, it's fast for reconnaissance, but um, without going into the technical details, it's not easy to fix the depth of the target that you see. You can see some features that may be almost certainly are very shallow, just under the surface, or somewhere in the depth range that the instrument is sensing to, which in our case is going to be up about up to eight or ten meters. Um, so they're the, they're the surveys that were uh, deployed uh, for 2004. Um, now the caveat. The um, EM method, or indeed any other geophysical method, is not a Spitfire detector. That particular piece of equipment, yeah, it's a metal detector. Detects electrical conductivity vari uh, variations. So, um, yes, it might uh, rather wonderfully be a Spitfire in a crate, and this superb model was uh, made by Martin Brown's colleagues at White Young Green. Um, but in terms of the, the maps we make and the anomalies we find, could be these. Um, it could be pier steel planking uh, in widespread use during, during World War II. Um, it could be any other old military or metal debris. Um, we can't discriminate between them. And certainly uh, PSP uh, is far from rare in the area. And this is a fence in downtown Yangon. Um, photograph was taken this January while we were out there. Masses of this material around and still, still, still in use. So in terms of what we can and can't do, um, if we find no anomalies whatsoever, fine, we, we can turn around to the archaeologists and say it's not worth the expensive and dangerous potentially task of excavating a hole on a conflict site in this area because there's nothing out of the ordinary in it as far as we can see. If we see an anomaly, then we can be more positive and say, yep, there's something worth following up, uh, as you'll hear in a minute, perhaps with more um, high, high resolution geophysical techniques to try and pin it down a little bit better. Um, but it is, again, necessary but not sufficient evidence of there actually being buried aircraft there. It's just buried conductive material. So with, with that kind of landscape uh, of what we uh, can and can't do, how we can and can't do it, what we offer, um, I'll now turn over to um, my former student and now colleague at Imperial College, Adam Booth, uh, to talk about the 2004 surveys. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for turning out in force for, for this event. Um, as Raj said, uh, my name is Dr. Adam Booth. I'm at uh, Imperial College London. Uh, but at the time, uh, 2004, um, I was just about to start a PhD at the University of Leeds uh, in the School of Earth Sciences. Um, I, I guess I was enthused by, uh, by, by David's uh, project. I, I still am. It's been a, an amazing adventure. It's been great to be part of. Um, but critically, I sort of had time on my hands um, in 2004 and was able to go out with David and uh, consult on 
on, on his, uh, his project. Um, I'm going to talk you through the, uh, the evidence that we collected in 2004 for there being uh, some burials having taken place, um, or at least geophysical data that supported that hypothesis. Um, what you can see um, over here is uh, a map of the, the modern uh, Mingaladon Airport in Yangon. Um, our survey site is here. I'm sorry the maps are in a slightly different orientation to what the archaeologists have shown, but um, this is where we're working. Um, and I'll just zoom out, uh, zoom in rather over here. Um, we have a survey area that uh, David Cundall led us to um, off the back of uh, some of his conversations with, with the veterans. And he said, you know, if we're surveying around here, we're probably looking in the right place for an initial reconnaissance. So we define an area that's uh, about 100 metres uh, long and uh, 180 metres wide. Um, you'll notice that the modern runway forms the, uh, the kind of baseline to our um, survey grid. So we went in here and, and conducted a whole series of electromagnetic measurements with our electromagnetic gear. Um, is that going to advance? Hello? There we go. Uh, okay, so um, this map... You, you may have seen, um, equivalents of this one were released to the press, they appeared on forums and newspapers and all sorts of things, um, so you may be familiar with the general shape of this one. Um, what you're looking at is essentially um, colour-coded electrical conductivities. So the more intense the colour, uh, the higher the electrical conductivity. If you see things that are very strongly white, uh, they're things that we would interpret as being electrically conductive in the subsurface. Um, just for reference, there's the, 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 the runway of the, the modern airport. Um, so we get um, two clear zones that um, are anomalously electrically conductive. Um, obviously enough, you know, the, the big white blobs. Um, and we, we, you know, we're quite encouraged that there is actually, there does appear to be something there that has an anomalous electrical conductivity in the subsurface. And we... As Roger said, the, the, the depth estimates you get with this EM apparatus um, are not the most accurate that we can possibly get with other geophysical methods, but we're confident that these come from up to 8 metres depth. So they're somewhere within the top 8 metres, 25 feet um, of the ground surface, um, and that's consistent with um, some of the hypotheses that, that David Cundall had. Um, we actually had time to, at the end of uh, this 2004 survey um, to do a, um, a trial excavation at the top end of, uh, of this anomaly, um, which wasn't the easiest thing in the world. This was done in, uh, in the monsoon season, so um, the, the, the ground was pretty wet and it actually made survey conditions in here uh, pretty difficult. Anyway, I sort of I build up this track record of worst places I have ever had to do surveys. And um, I think this still ranks as the number one. Um, wading through the swamp every day, you know, with snakes and things like that was not particularly good fun. Um, but nonetheless, um, we were able to do a trial excavation here. Um, unfortunately, just as this was about to get interesting, um, there was a political situation around at the time in 2004 that when we got some, some evidence of there being some burials there... Um, the dig was halted and uh, we, we weren't uh, allowed to do any more work on site. Um, so um, there's certainly a good case for further surveying. Um, there's compelling evidence for, for buried metal. The conductivities we were recording are higher than you might expect for any um, natural geological uh, property, any geological formations, any soils, things like that. So we're pretty confident there's metal there. Um, our trial excavation uh, revealed uh, some, uh, some wooden planking. Now, whether this uh, was the, the top of a crate, which, you know, suddenly you, you expect these Spitfires to be in crates, suddenly crunch, you hear some wood, you go, is it, is it? But you just couldn't get down that little bit more uh, because of the restrictions that were in place on us. Um, so we've certainly found some wood that could be interpreted as the, uh, the, the material of a burial crate. Um, but the conductivity, the electrical conductivity, is currently unexplained. Uh, therefore, for, our, for the latest stage of our survey, the question still stands, are those anomalies buried spitfires? We can't say yes or no yet. So further geophysical surveys uh, were recommended, and some of those took place in the interim period between 2004 and our 2013 survey, but we certainly did some more of these uh, when we were out there in, uh, in January 2013. Um, so when we revisited it, um, having talked to our um, conflict archaeological colleagues, um, 
rather than um, directly targeting Spitfires, they wanted us to try. They wanted us to try and perform surveys that would characterise the whole of the site. So we're not just looking for buried Spitfires anymore. We're trying to characterise and contextualise the whole of the archaeological site that Mingaladon Airfield represents. Um, there's more going on th than just the Spitfires. We've heard about the relevance of the Prome Road. Um, certainly, um, our good friend Stanley Coombe, um, a lot of his um, own story is about uh, the significance of the Prome Road and that he saw uh, these aircraft apparently being prepared while he was on the Prome Road. So if we can find the Prome Road, we can put ourselves where Stanley was standing. And then we can say, we look over there, that's where he could see these planes, potentially. Um, we're going to repeat the 2004 EM survey grid and extend it, and then also hit the survey site with some other methods, um, such as a functioning clicker. There we go. Um, we, um, one of the things, things that we brought along was a, a differential GPS system. Um, not only do we want to position our survey grids, we can walk along with the differential GPS and measure all the lumps and bumps on the site, which may point towards things being buried there. Um, we also brought along uh, this particular toy, uh, electrical resistivity tomography, which uh, Andy Merritt is uh, doing his PhD research using, and therefore he's our kind of local expert in that, so we asked him to come along, and there he is operating uh, the system. Uh, this is essentially a voltmeter for the ground. Again, it's measuring electrical properties, but instead of mapping out an area, it creates like a vertical cross-section through the ground. And this is why we can get better estimates of depth from it. Um, we don't just map out from the surface. We actually see in depth where these um, conductive bodies may be. Uh, the third technique, third extra technique we brought along uh, was magnetometry. Um, magnetic materials in the ground, such as steel, um, they distort the Earth's magnetic field, and this sensor uh, can detect those distortions and we can infer uh, magnetic properties in the ground there. It's also important not only for finding the steel components of, of the buried Spitfires, for example, but some of the airport infrastructure. Um, the concrete may have steel reinforcements in, um, so we can detect that using this. And then from a risk assessment point of view, um, if there's unexploded ordnance there, we might expect big magnetic anomalies if we are unfortunate enough to be stood surveying directly over an unexploded bomb. Um, we don't really want to see that, but nonetheless, it's part of the risk assessment. So, um, a similar map to what I showed you before. Here we have um, the extent of what we did in 2004, and I've tacked onto the end, um, so further to the south at Mingaladon, um, the results of our 2013 survey. Um, what you'll notice is, again, there's, here are the, the anomalies from 2004. Joining them are this big white patch here, and then this black patch going this way. Um, now, on this colour scale, um, sorry, this is set up for the magnetics uh, that will appear in a minute, but still on this colour scale, this black um, area here should be interpreted as something that's very electrically conductive. So we have our original anomalies and two more here. What I would say about these, though, is that compared, when we repeated these, um, in 2013, they seem to have disappeared, and this was puzzling in the first place. We were doing this in the dry season, and we initially wondered, well, maybe it's because of the different ground conditions. So in 2004, we were serving over wet ground. Now it's very, very dry. Is that a reason why these anomalies have disappeared? Well, we didn't think that was a convincing enough argument. What we did find is some of the uh, records from, uh, I think, around 2007, from some geophysical work that was conducted at this site, um, suggest that there were trial excavations that went on and some metallic material was removed from those. But we don't know how extensive they were and we don't know exactly where they took place. But there is some compelling evidence, both from the geophysics and, as Martin Brown will introduce in the next part of this talk, there's some compelling evidence that the ground in this area has been disturbed. So, unfortunately, I don't think we're comparing like with like. But over here, what are these two anomalies about? Well, this one here, we can have, we, we know what this is because there's, uh, around this area, um, there are some very large runway landing lights, um, and undoubtedly there are large high voltage cables associated with those. Again, part of the risk assessment, we don't want to dig through these high voltage cables. But we think that these anomalies, this strip of anomalies here are related to those cables. However, this one is more interesting because just here, there's a little patch of exposed concrete. 
um, that has steel reinforcements in it. And we think that this is part of the old infrastructure from you know, 1945, certainly from Second World War times. Um, we can stick the uh, magnetic data that we acquired on top of this. Um, over here, where we didn't expect to see very much from the EM data, we don't see very much in the magnetics data, perhaps just some very small, discrete, isolated anomalies. But over here, again, a very nice, very discrete patch of magnetic anomalies that really tie up nicely with the location of this, um, this, this part of the old infrastructure. Um, sorry, I'll just flip back to this. Um, and this has some really significant implications for the location of the old Prom Road uh, where Stanley Coombe, uh, to which Stanley Coombe refers. Um, we were able to tie this up with aerial photography and find that this matches really nicely with an old taxiway uh, from the 1945 infrastructure. And the Prom Road goes somewhere next to it. And so we were able to advise if you dig just somewhere over here compared to this anomaly, then you're likely to find the Prom Road. And Martin will talk about the results of that. Uh, the resistivity data now. Um, we have two profiles here. These are, again, I said they're slices through the ground of, of electrical structure. Um, the upper one corresponds to this arrow here, which goes partly through our test site from 2004. And also profile two, I'm sorry, uh, have I got that wrong way around? Profile one is this one, I'm afraid. And uh, profile two is this one. So profile one, we did that where we didn't expect anything to be buried. We wanted an idea of what the background looked like. And you can see that in terms of the potential for, for buried big objects, it's actually quite boring. Um, it's just got horizontal layering, which is actually consistent with the environmental, um, the environmental kind of makeup of the site at the time. Uh, we have very low conductivity in the near surface. The ground has been baked hard during the dry season. But then at around two metres depth or so, we see an increase in electrical conductivity. And when we excavated, uh, we found that that corresponds nicely to the water table. So this is where we see um, the ground goes saturated, becomes more electrically conductive. In this one, however, again, as I say, it goes through the location of the, uh, of the test excavation, we do see some sort of structure. Um, it's not like the sort of boring situation that we have over here. And this structure is, is pretty interesting. It's not natural. It doesn't strike me as being the signature from, from a buried Spitfire. It's not highly electrically conductive. However, it is structure that's worth investigating just to work out, as Andy said at the end of his little uh, part of the talk, um, just to actually pin down what this legend is all about. So we're going to go, go and do a trial excavation here. Our recommendation was that um, the EM survey and resistivity data suggest the 2004 survey site is disturbed, but we should still investigate that old anomaly to, 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 to answer the question. Combined with the aerial photos, the 2013 data suggests that this oblique anomaly, uh, that, that big black strip that I showed you in the EM data, um, is old infrastructure, and it could be used to locate the prone road. And if we just pull up the EM map from here, that means that we're, serve, uh, we're scheduling test trenches and test, ex test excavations over our old survey dig, uh, over our old test site here. And also we opened a series of slots and trenches um, based around this oblique anomaly that, again, as I say, might tie up with the location of Prome Road. And with that, um, I'm going to pass on to Martin to give you the, uh, the results from th those excavations. Thanks very much. I'm Martin Brown. I work for WYG. I'm an archaeological consultant. Um, over the past however many years it is, I've done everything from working on site, digging holes, actually not that far from here, working for the Museum of London. I've worked for English Heritage, um, a couple of county councils, and as you heard, 10 years with the Ministry of Defence. Um, one of the exciting things about being approached by Wargaming to be part of this project was that for 10 years I had people ringing me up or when I was visiting their site bending my ear and saying, oh, if you go and look over there you'll find the delete as applicable Harley Davidson's Spitfires, etc., etc., Kubelwagens at Lugerschul's my favourite. Um, long story, grab me afterwards, I'll tell you all about it. Um, no. Um, <laughs> 
I did actually uh, excavate a pit just before we went out to Myanmar uh, on the airfield at Uphaven and found a whole load of RAF uh, number plates and some rusty spanners. The, n the number plates were great. They gave us secure 1945 dating, and it was really a definite case of, oh, God, get rid of these. And when I come back from my brew, I don't want them to be here. Um, which was nice. Anyway, um, my role was not so much uh, like everybody else to dig up spitfires. It was to continue the CSI analogy to be the crime scene manager or the SOCO, the scene of crime officer. My role uh, was not to say, dig here, that this is the good stuff is here. It was to uh, work with everyone else um, to decide where we dug and then to report, record and interpret the remains. So I do that every day of my life, my working life. I, I do evaluations for people. I, our clients come, we do desk-based assessments, we get teams out on site, we find out what's there, we, we report, they, they then work accordingly as a result. It's, it's a standard evaluation. Um, normally we don't have this sort of thing happening on day one. Um, the site was blessed. The snakes were uh, conjoined not to bother us and didn't. Um, and this was important cultural ritual being undertaken by our key partners. It was an unexpected delay. It was really important to them. It was thus really important to us. Um, but it was one of a series of unexpected delays, along with not being given service plans by the airport. I can understand that. I suspect if I turned up with a team outside Terminal 3 and said we're going to start digging holes looking for the buried Messi Smiths, um, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> airport authority might look at me a bit funny. Um, but we were beset by bureaucracy. Um, even when we thought we'd anticipated it, and you heard about Tracy's endless series of meetings, um, there was always another delay to the point at which on one occasion some trenching had to be done at the insistence of the airport by night when the airport was closed. Not ideal. You never saw Time Team doing that, did you? It's not ideal. I do not recommend it to my clients on a daily basis. However, when we were able to dig, and thanks to JCB for the magnificent kit that they gave us, um, for those of you who are thinking, here's an archaeologist, he's going to talk about teaspoons. Not this one. You can do an awful lot of work with one of those. Good stuff as well. Um, positions for trenching were agreed collaboratively. It was very important we had buy-in from everybody on site, whether that was the airport manager, the STP site manager, who was an absolute star, um, geophysics, David as project initiator, and myself as, as, as archaeologist, and Manny, our machine driver. But that's basically what's going on there. Um, and you can see Rod uh, doing close protection, if you will, um, by monitoring the strip for any remains that are coming up, but also keeping a close eye in case there's anything that looks unpleasant and that we need to be careful of. Again, to maintain our CSI image uh, analogy, we tried to keep the crime scene sterile. Um, we had safety areas cordoned off, the magic tape. This satisfied me um, because I didn't want to see anybody get driven over by a big yellow trowel. But it also satisfied not only the airport authorities, but the transport minister, who was obviously keeping quite a close eye on things because we were digging holes on their, their hub airport. However, when we did dig, this is in the area that Adam was just talking about, the area that uh, he had surveyed originally, and then the resurvey was a little bit problematic. And this is why. What you can see is a good two meters of disturbed earth. Coming down onto a blue clay. The blue clay is where we stopped. It hadn't been disturbed. That blue clay is geological. 
that's been there for some thousands of years. There is nothing beneath it uh, of interest to anyone looking at the mid-20th century, unless they've tunnelled in. Um, but there is certainly nothing dug into that. It also, as you heard, creates problems because of the water table. This area had been significantly disturbed. However, within it, there were archaeological artefacts. This is a major piece of structural timber. The guys are in there for useful scale. This is not a piece of fence post, it's not a piece of bracing from a crate for anything. It's a big bit of wood. There were several of these unearthed on the site. Um, and there's one with all the scales in place. And you can see the carpentry marks and the mortise holes. If we were working on a medieval site, uh, we might be expecting to haul that sort of thing out of the ditch uh, or the moat as being bits of either building or... Um, bridge abutment, and I, I think what we're looking at here is one of the structures that appear uh, and then disappear from the uh, photographs that you saw back at the beginning. There were also uh, bits of brick in there, uh, pieces of pierced steel plate, um, not huge amounts of it. In fact, the biggest bit was probably about that, but it was there. Post-war... Re reconstruction, clearance, maybe it would be consistent with that sort of interpretation, but equally it would be consistent with some digging that happened between um, Adam and David's visit in 2004 and our 2013 expedition. Uh, the other deposit here, our structure, is one of those concrete areas that we... Um, that Adam mentioned, it's been disturbed by, or well, partly demolished. Uh, that is the remnant of one of those um, taxiways. It's, it's, it's proper good runway quality concrete and, and blacktop. Our long trench across the new survey was interesting in many ways. That's archaeologically soils interesting, not uh, things that fly interesting. But it's, it reinforces the idea of the water table being quite high up and the problems of the blue clay. The blue clay is rolling slightly as it does. We dipped slightly into it here with the JCB. And as you can see, it instantly filled up with water. The water percolated in from three sides of the trench and formed a lovely pond. Um, if nothing else, it suggests to me that this is not a good place to bury things that you want preserving. Uh, I think that would, that, if nothing else, uh, there is environmental determinism against the idea of burying things to dig them up later on. However, <laughs> The interesting thing in this trench is at the far end. And this is classic, last day, last afternoon, the good stuff turns up stuff. That's a dirt track. Doesn't look a lot, but there is your dirt track. It's on the right alignment to be one of, if not the road, the famous Prome Road. Um, I suspect there's some track variants uh, as, as in the monsoon and things, so it, it, it's part of it. It's the same sort of dirt track that we drove on on the day that we had a day out and went out up country. What's really interesting about it happens over here. That might not look a, lo a lot to you. I'll grant you that. <laughs> There's a feature here. There's the blue clay coming in. And it stops just on the clay. Very clever, this. Road's just there. There's one of those bits of brick and the, the road surface. I initially looked at this. And it's a roadside ditch. But 
nothing terribly unusual about finding a ditch along the side of a road anywhere in the world. And then when I started to look at it close, more closely as we were doing the, uh, the drawings, you start to see that there are discrete blobs, technical term, of soils. These blobs are about that big, about that wide, about that deep. And they are consistent with something that I've seen in Britain and in France and in Belgium. And they're sandbags. They're full sandbags that when you're clearing up your site, well, there's an awful lot of ways that you could fill that hole in, but actually the lazy squaddy way is to kick the full sandbags back into the hole. Extensive ethnographic research with squaddies has told me that this is exactly what you do if you can get away with it. Um, so why have we got a sandbag-filled roadside ditch? I would refer you to Mr. Scott's evidence about the bombing. Whether you are British garrison driving up and down the road across the end of the runway, or Japanese, the chances of being caught out in the open in your truck by a visiting enemy aircraft are not a pleasant prospect. Having something you can jump down into that will provide some shelter makes the day at least a little bit better. That's interpretation one. Interpretation two was also referred to by Rod. Rudimentary airfield close defence, you, know, you go to somewhere like Big In Hill and you've got your pillboxes and your battle headquarters and all those lovely things. Out here, if you haven't got that, actually having a roadside ditch that you can turn into some sort of fire trench is better than nothing. And frankly, if someone starts shooting at you, better than nothing really is better than nothing. So we have our conflict archaeology. It's not big, it's not sexy. But I was really pleased we saw it. Because actually what we were there to do was, yes, if we'd been able to stand here and I'd been able to show you pictures of rusty things in boxes, that would have been fab. Yes, one of the reasons I went was hoping that we could do that. But the real reason for going is to take a really good story and set it in its landscape, look at its landscape, see the palimpsest, that sense of landscape where a modern 21st century landscape has the bits of the previous century sticking up through it. How the, the road is still there. How the fire trench tells you a little story that's never going to be in anybody's memoirs. You know, filled a load of sandbags and put them by the side of the road. It's not the sort of thing that you makes a bestseller. These little moments tell us one what happened to Adam's results. They tell us, too, what some of the timbers may have been that were encountered. Yep, they're structural. But three, our evidence also tells us something about the experience of all those people on both sides who were there. And I think that's the point at which I'm going to shut up, but by paying tribute to Wargaming and to David, between them, having the vision to do something beyond a treasure hunt for some Spitfires. Andy? This is the point, really, where we start to pull everything together. Um, you've heard about the geophysics. You've heard about the field archaeology from Martin there. You've heard about uh, Rod's work with the BDAs. And it's really time to try and make sense of all this. Um, as Martin said, one of the issues that we faced was these unexpected delays. And if you put archaeologists together and give them a delay, they normally have a brew, and then maybe another one if the delay is going on. Um, maybe you end up in the pub. In this case, we ended up in my hotel room. Um, because Rod had suggested we try something which is standard practice on the kind of investigations that he's taken part in in his day job. And that is to do a whiteboard timeline and evidence assessment. What we did was 
get a whiteboard up from the office supplies section of the hotel. And then starting in May 1945, when Rangoon fell to the British, take the timeline through until the couple, a few months after the last opportunity that David suggested that uh, aircraft might have been buried at Mingledon. And then what we did was put in every single piece of evidence that we picked up from the documents, from the air photographs, from conversations with people, from witness statements uh, that we've been given and so on. So hence, you see this, these different colours, the, um, lots of fun and games with marking pens. And um, that's what it looked like by the end. Um, this is a morning's work by three people who really rather be out digging. But this is really important in the end. And the really important bit is down here. Because this period we're looking at is the early spring, here you can see March, April, May 1946. Now earlier on we saw the um, port returns from 41 Embarkation Unit. Um, we've also referred to Stanley Coombe's experience. And this is where we bring them together with the Prome Road. Because we knew when Stan arrived at Mingledon in Rangoon because it was just after his birthday. He'd been posted elsewhere and he'd been posted to Rangoon to join a new, new unit and was travelling up country on the back of an army lorry. And as he describes it, um, he was driving up the old Prome Road out of Rangoon at a point when he's near that old maintenance and um, dispersal area that I showed you on the air photographs, just on the, um, on the, on the, on the south, uh, southwest side of the, of, of the site we were working. Uh, he looks out of the uh, side of the vehicle and sees crates and activity. Um, the next day, he's back on the airfield doing a job and he asks an RAF man, what was in those crates over there? Because he can see them from the other side of the airfield now. They're still there. And the RAF man says, would you believe it, mates? They're spitfires. Um, what we can tie that to is a delivery of more Osters that 41EU took delivery of in that period in April 1946. Um, We've also got the, the aircraft that we saw delivered earlier. We don't know if they were even taken out of their crates, as I said earlier. So it's possible that either aircraft in crates or the crates themselves, because remember, they're short of timber and things like that. They may be keeping, they may be stockpiling stuff for reuse or whatever. We don't know. But we've got the coincidence of what Stanley sees and a candidate for what he's actually seeing, plus all that activity that we showed you in the images of the runways and the, uh, the rebuilding and the maintenance that's going on on the runways. Um, at the same time, we also see evidence for what's really going on in terms of Spitfires. If you look down here, um, we've got evidence that Spitfires are sent um, to Selatar uh, by aircraft carrier from Rangoon. Uh, and further Spitfires, uh, Mark 8 this time, are given to the French who are just reoccupying French Indochina and are just beginning to face the insurgency that turns into the French Indochina, the wars of French Indochina and the war for Vietnamese independence of Viet Minh. Um, and in fact, one of the Spitfire squadrons that is based at Ming Ledon is flown out to Saigon to uh, offer a show of strength in support of the French at exactly this period. Um, and so we have that coming together of the evidence which we think offers an explanation, um, a, 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 certainly a, 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 a strong working hypothesis for what the origin of this story is. It's a coming together of certain activities, certain objects and artifacts that are observed by people and interpreted by people and that then get passed on to other people. Um, and so the evidence-based case that we have is that while the opportunity existed for the RAF to bury aircraft at what was then RAF Mingledon, now Yangon International, 
the means and the motive just doesn't exist. The technical difficulties, the shortage of labor, the shortage of timber, the shortage of heavy equipment, um, it just, uh, not to mention the physical difficulties of that site that you've seen with the, the work that uh, Martin and Adam have described, it makes it physically virtually impossible that this could have happened. There's ample evidence, in, in, uh, uh, to the contrary, um, in fact, that, that Spitfires and other aircraft, many, many hundreds even of other aircraft, are disposed of in ways that are attested all over the world as the uh, fighting powers demobilize and get rid of surplus equipment, worn out equipment, and so on. It's, um, it, it's scrap, junked, left to one side to rot, whatever. You certainly don't waste your time and resources digging very large holes to put the things in when in fact the quickest and most fun way of getting rid of a, an aircraft is what they did in India in some cases, which was get a crane and drop a concrete block on the tail. Um, there's other ways of doing it as well. Um, or you just scrap the thing and sell it, as you saw, sell it to the local scrap dealers to turn into pots and pans. Um, it's, we can also say that the archaeological evidence that, that Martin's described entirely backs up the documentary work that we did, the desktop assessment, um, and I think Certainly, we can say that, in, to use a legal analogy again, beyond reasonable doubt, there are no buried Spitfires on RAF Mingledon, and by extension, we believe, on any of the other sites that have been mentioned in Burma. It just does not stack up. Whichever way you look at it, whichever way you twist it. Now, it doesn't mean it was a wasted project. It doesn't mean it was a wasted journey. Um, because what we have done, I think, um, and all of us have been involved in, um, from David as project initiator down, is a journey of exploration really into our relationship as human beings with these histories, with these iconic objects, with this, in this case, this lost war. Um, why did it become so widely believed? Um, that's a discussion perhaps for another evening if we, if we were talking about media studies. Certainly, it was a great adventure, and for, the, uh, for our friends in the press and broadcast media who gave it so much coverage, it was great copy. Um, people want these stories to be true. Um, Spitfires, the Harleys, the Willis Jeeps, uh, the, the Irving jackets that are boxed up brand new in a barn in Lincolnshire, you know, they're, they're, all, um, they're all iconic objects. We all, we'd, we'd love them to be there. The Quest story is a universal story in folklore. And it's compelling. You know, think of Odysseus, Jason and the Argonauts. Um, you know, it, it, and also people like a mystery. And certainly in this day and age, when you know, probably trust in our politicians and governments is an all-time low, we love a conspiracy theory. Um, we'd love to think that Lord Louis Mountbatten, you know, one of the um, greatest self-publicists in probably military history, um, would have had a back channel to initiate a project like this. It would be a fabulous story if he had. Unfortunately, we can say he didn't. I think also, and this is where I have to step back and look at these stories as a, a generic part of the human experience, really. So I'm, not, I'm no longer talking about the Burma Spitfires project. I'm talking about the way myths come to be part of our daily lives and come to be believed by, if not everybody, by a significant number of people in, uh, if certain circumstances prevail. Um, there's a standard work by Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Loftus, who's an American psychologist. Um, she's a, an expert in the generation of memory and how memory can be affected by external circumstances. And she wrote misinf about misinformation, that misinformation can cause people to falsely believe that they saw details that were only suggested to them. Misinformation can even lead people to have very rich false memories. And once embraced, people can express those false memories with confidence and detail. Um, she goes on, in the real world, misinformation comes in in many forms. When witnesses to an event talk to, with one another, when they're interrogated with leading questions or suggestive techniques, when they see media coverage about an event, misinformation can enter consciousness and can cause contamination of memory. Does anyone watch Ancient Aliens on the History Channel? Um, and then a, a final comment from, from Ross and Anderson um, about belief and people's abilities to maintain belief. Um, 
should they say, as you, can, as you can see, belief can survive potent logical or even empirical challenges. They can survive and even be bolstered by evidence that most uncommitted observers would agree logically demands some weakening of such beliefs. They can even survive the total destruction of the original evidential basis. In other words, some people can find themselves in a psychological place, you know, whether it's about the lone gunman or the Titanic wasn't the Titanic or the, astronaut, you know, the, 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 the moon landing happened in a film studio in California. Um, that the, 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 in spite of all the evidence, and in fact because people are challenging the evidence, it makes people more determined than ever to believe. I'll finish with one more quote, and it's, um, it's one of my favourite quotes. Uh, I think all historians should remember this one. It's, um, it's one of the earliest um, historical accounts in British literature. Um, it's a monk called Nanias who wrote a book in Wales, and he wrote the first real historical study of King Arthur, this great folk hero, this great iconic figure of, 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 of literature and, and, and nationalism. And he wrote of his book, which was basically a compilation of evidence. He said, this is the translation from the original Latin, I have made a heap of all I found. Now, Nanias' book is a wonderful book. As history, it's extremely dubious. These stories, these myths, these urban myths, I think are also wonderful stories. They don't hurt anybody. Maybe a few bank accounts, but people can survive that. These stories are a part of us, and I think we should treasure them, cherish them, try to understand them as we've done here, and that's where I'm going to leave it and hand back to Tracy. As Myanmar continues to open up to the possibilities of tourism and business with foreign partners, we hope our small part will inspire future projects which seek to explore the links between our various peoples and the people of Myanmar, which were forged in war and the struggle for independence, but which can now, we can now explore together in a time of shared hope. With that hope goes the further hope that one day the families of veterans and military historians and uh, enthusiasts will visit conflict sites of the forgotten war in Burma in the same way and the same numbers as visit the sites of conflict in northern France and Belgium at when, and that when they do they will look, wonder and remember as we did at the Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery outside of Yangon. Our team believes that the true memory of that forgotten war is far more important than any single artifact from it however iconic and valuable, because it is the memory which brings together people from all over the world in one of the most beautiful and vibrant nations of Southeast Asia. We're happy to announce tonight, as a result of our work in Myanmar uh, earlier this year, that the Commonwealth Graves Commission has contacted the archaeology and geophysics team to investigate a World War II crash site to recover and repatriate the service personnel remains. And also, Dr. Clark uh, was asked to work with the Myanmar Government Committee on Modernizing Yangon University and the Myanmar Higher Education System. And this is all because of uh, our trip uh, to Mingladon uh, to explore this uh, wonderful and amazing legend. And that was our team uh, that made this uh, trip to uh, Myanmar. So thank you. <laughs>